The children of Israel are now in the land that God promised to give their forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They were facing the first of many battles to take the land. The Canaanites were already terrified of Israel and their God. If Israel was victorious in this first battle, then the children of Israel would have confidence going forward, and the Canaanites would be even more fearful of, of Israel and her God. Now, in addition to being the first battle fought in the land, this battle of Jericho displayed God's power and sovereignty. So what does this battle reveal about the conquest of the land under Joshua? And what does it tell us about the battles that Yeshua will fight when he returns? I'm Dan Cathcart, and this is The Promise of Rest. As we begin this portion of the book of Joshua about taking the land, we need to review God's commands to Israel regarding the people of the land. Moses instructed in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 7 that Israel was to utterly destroy the Canaanite nations. They were not to enter marriages or other covenants with them, and they were to totally destroy their altars, their idols, and their carved images. The city of Jericho was the first test of how the children of Israel handled these instructions. As they prepared to take the city of Jericho, Joshua went out to survey the city and, sur and the surrounding land. Perhaps he was planning on how to take the city. Answers in Genesis states that the city walls were believed to be 12 to 15 feet high with an additional 2 foot mud brick wall and 6 feet deep. It was very unlikely that Israel had the siege engines that they needed to break down these walls. It was also unlikely that they had the necessary provisions to enact a prolonged siege against the city. As Joshua surveyed the city, he lifted up his eyes and saw what appeared to be a man. Joshua 5 verse 13 And it came to pass, when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, a man stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? Now this man was definitely a warrior who indicated that he was ready for battle. The question Joshua had was on which side of the coming battle would he fight? As a general and the man in charge, Joshua had uh, have already been thinking about how he could utilize this man's skills. Now, the man deflected Joshua's question and set Joshua straight. Joshua was, was not in charge. He was. Look at Joshua 5, verse 14. So he said, No, but as the commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped him, and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? Now the man declares that he had come as the commander of the army of the Lord. Now why is the word now included? Now one possible reason is that this is the same angel that God promised would go before them to drive out the Canaanites in Exodus 33, 2-18. God elaborated on this promise to Moses by saying his presence would go with Moses and give Moses rest. At Moses' insistence, God agreed that he would go, not just with Moses, but with all of Israel. Joshua's response to the commander was to immediately humble himself and acknowledge him as his master and commander. He put himself under the authority of the commander. The first instruction that Joshua received was to remove his sandal because the place was holy. Joshua 5 verse 15. Then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take your sandal off your foot, for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. Now this is similar to the event when God first appeared to Moses at the burning bush. God's first instruction to Moses was to remove his sandals because he stood on holy ground. Exodus 3 verse 5. 
Then he said, Do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. The place where Joshua stood was not holy ground like the place where Moses stood. It was a holy place that God had set aside. The Art Scroll series book, Joshua Judges, comments on the sage's understanding of the meaning of the holy place where Joshua stood. The angel was signifying that Jericho could not be conquered by physical means. The land was holy, and Israel's enemies would be defeated only through God's miracles. Now, things that are set aside as holy belong only to the Lord and cannot be used for other purposes. The nature of God setting Jericho apart as holy will become clear as Joshua receives more instructions from the Lord. At the burning bush, Moses encountered Jehovah. God spoke to Moses out of the bush. Now, is this commander of the army of the Lord also a manifestation of God through a pre-incarnate Yeshua? The next instruction Joshua receives makes it clear that Joshua is speaking to Jehovah. Joshua 6, 1 and 2. Now Jericho was securely shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand its king, and its mighty men of valor. As they were standing, surveying the city that Joshua had certainly already noticed was securely closed up, the Lord told him to see. Even though Jericho was secured against invasion, he had already given it to Joshua's hand. The city was to be entirely destroyed. There was only one exception from the command to utterly destroy Jericho. Rahab and her family and all her possessions were to be saved from this destruction. Joshua 6, 17-19 Now the city shall be doomed by the Lord to destruction, and it and all who are in it. Only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all who are with her in her house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. And you, by all means, abstain from the accursed things, lest you become accursed when you take of the accursed things and make the camp of Israel a curse, and trouble it. But all the silver and gold and vessels of bronze and iron are consecrated to the Lord, and they shall come into the treasury of the Lord. The word translated as doomed is the Hebrew word karem, number 2764 in Strong's Concordance, meaning a net. Figuratively, it is a doomed object or dedicated thing which must either be destroyed or used only as a devoted object to the Lord. Now, for example, a man who de dedicates a field to the Lord and chooses not to redeem it in the year of Jubilee, that field becomes karem, or devoted to the Lord. Look at Leviticus 27, 20 and 21. But if he does not want to redeem the field, or if he has sold the field to another man, it shall not be redeemed any more. But the field, when it is released in the Jubilee, shall be holy to the Lord as a devoted field. It shall be the possession of the priests. The produce of the field and of anything devoted to the Lord is grouped with the firstfruits offerings as belonging to the priests. As for the other aspects of karem, anything that corrupts or is an abomination is karem in the sense of being accursed. It must be totally destroyed. Deuteronomy 7 verse 26 Nor shall you bring an abomination into your house, lest you be doomed to destruction like it. You shall utterly detest it and utterly abhor it, for it is an accursed thing. So Jericho has elements of both meanings of Karem, as a city containing idolatry, abominable objects, and acts associated with idolatry, Jericho was accursed. Israel was not to allow any of these objects and practices into its camp. As the first city taken in the Promised Land, it has elements of the first fruits offering. As the first city to be taken, all of its riches belong to God. As for actually taking the city, they wouldn't besiege Jericho in a typical manner. 
the Lord gave Joshua some strange instructions for how to take the city, which included numerous uh, appearances of the number seven. Seven priests were to take seven horns and circle the city for seven days. On the seventh day, they were to blow the horns and the walls of the city would fall. For the first six days, they were only to circle the city once. Joshua 6, verses 3 and 4. You shall march around the city, all you men of war. You shall go all around the city once. This you shall do six days. And seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. But the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. On each day, seven priests were to go before the Ark of the Covenant and bear seven trumpets of ram's horns. Joshua explains exactly how they carried out the instructions for each of the six days. Look at Joshua 6, 8 and 9. So it was when Joshua had spoken to the people that the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of the ram's horns before the Lord advanced and blew the trumpets, and the ark of the covenant of the Lord followed them. The, the armed men went before the priests who blew the trumpets, and the rear guard came after the ark, while the priest continued blowing the trumpets. The armed men in front of the ark were probably the armies of the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and half-tribe of Manasseh. A condition for inheriting the land east of the Jordan was that they were to go before the children of Israel in battle. The rest of the tribes probably made up the rear guard with the tribe of Dan, who was described as the rear guard in their travels in the wilderness, bringing up the very rear. Other than the sound of the ram's horns from the priests, the rest of the army was to remain silent until the seventh day. Joshua 6, verse 10. Now Joshua had commanded the people, saying, You shall not shout or make any noise with your voice, nor shall a word proceed out of your mouth, until the day I say to you, Shout. Then you shall shout. Now notice in this ritual encompasses a full week. That means that one of the seven days was the Sabbath. It is most likely that the seventh day of the ritual was the Sabbath. The Art Scroll series book, Joshua Judges, comments on the preponderance of sevens, the seven days in particular. The seven sets of seven, seven koanim, seven shofars, seven days, and the seven circuits allude to a mystery known to those who understand the secret of creation. The number seven represents God's presence in creation and that all human and natural activity stems from God's creative and guiding hand. As illustrated at the beginning of time, when God brought everything into being in six days and rested on the seventh. Thus the Sabbath is the weekly reminder that the universe emerges from him, and the number seven symbolizes the concept of spiritual completion. The comment continues, emphasizing the connection of the destruction of Jericho to the Sabbath. As noted above, the sanctity of the Sabbath, the sets of seven, was instrumental in the victory. It may be, therefore, that God wanted this crucial act first victory to be culminated on that day. Now, there's another hidden seven in the account of Jericho. The phrase, seven trumpets of a ram's horns, in verse 4, 6, 8 and 13 reveals a possible connection to the year of jubilee the literal reading of this phrase would be the seven ram's horns of the jubilees the year of jubilee occurs the year after every cycle of 49 years or seven times seven years it is a sabbath year in which all the land is allowed to rest slaves are set free the land returns to its original owner the announcement of the year of Jubilee is through the blowing of the shofar or the ram's horn. Look at Leviticus 25, 9 and 10. Then you shall cause the trumpet, the shofar, of the Jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month. On the day of atonement you shall make the trumpet, that is shofar, to sound throughout all your land. 
And you shall consecrate the fiftieth year, and proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee, Yobel, for you. And each of you shall return to his possession, and each of you shall return to his family. The word Yobel is used in only three places in the Bible, two of which we have already mentioned, the year of Jubilee and the sounding of the ram's horns at Jericho. The first use of the word Yobel was at Mount Sinai, when the sound of Yobel called the children of Israel to meet God at the base of Mount Sinai. Exodus 19, verse 13. When the trumpet, Yobel, sounds long, they shall come near the mountain. Now, like Mount Sinai, the people were to respond when the Yobel sounded long. They were to respond with a great shout. Joshua 6, verse 5. Now it shall come to pass when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, Yobel, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, Shofar, that all the people shall shout with a great shout. Then the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up, every man straight before him. At the sound of the ram's horns and the great shout of the people, the walls of Jericho fell down flat. The word translated as flat is the Hebrew word takath, number 8478, meaning the bottom. The word study dictionary defines it as a position below or beneath some other reference point. Archaeological evidence shows that the walls crumbled down to the ground level, forming a ramp, allowing the armies to walk over the lower retaining wall and directly into the city. The two men who had promised to spare Rahab and her family went to her home and brought the family out safely. Joshua 6, 23 and 24. But Joshua had said to the two men who had spied out the country, Go to the harlot's house, and from there bring out the woman and all that she has, as you swore to her. And the young men who had been spies went in and brought out Rahab, her father, her mother, her brothers, and all that she had. So they brought out all her relatives and left them outside the camp of Israel. But they burned the city and all that was in it with fire. Only the silver and gold and the vessels of bronze and iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. Rahab was first brought out of Jericho, but kept outside the camp of Israel. It was only after the destruction of Jericho that Rahab and her family were allowed to enter the camp. Joshua 6, verse 25. And Joshua spared Rahab the harlot, her father's household, and all that she had. So she dwells in Israel to this day, because she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. When Yeshua returns, his return will be preceded by two witnesses who will provide protection for the altar and the temple of God in Jerusalem. The residents of the city are described as idolatrous, similar to Sodom and Egypt. Although the two witnesses will be killed, the voice of God will re resurrect them, and they will then be called up to heaven. Then the seventh trumpet will sound, announcing the arrival of the king or the kingdom of Jehovah and Yeshua. Revelation 11, verse 15. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. This is the signal for our arrival on the scene. Now, like at Mount Sinai, the long blast of the trumpet will call us to assembly. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16-17 For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, and the voice of an archangel, and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Yeshua comes as the commander of the army of the Lord. Revelation 19, 11 through 15. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. 
His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a written name that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, and with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. With the sharp sword of his mouth, he overpowers Jerusalem and brings justice to the nations. Jerusalem, which was defiled by idolatry and the abominations of the Antichrist, will be purified once more, but will be holy to the Lord. Zechariah 14, 20 through 21. In that day, holiness to the Lord shall be engraved on the bells of the horses. The pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. Yes, every pot in Jerusalem and Judah shall be holiness to the Lord of hosts. Everyone who sacrifices shall come and take them and cook in them. In that day, there shall no longer be a Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. Jericho was the first battle that Israel participated in when they entered the Promised Land. The battle was not won by the physical forces of Israel, although they played a part after the walls of Jericho came down. It was God and a pre-incarnate Yeshua as the commander of the army of the Lord who directed and won the battle. When Yeshua returns as the commander of the Lord's army, he will direct the battle and win the war and all the nations of the earth will have rest. I'm Dan Cathcart for Moed Ministries International. Shalom and be blessed.